presentation is the beginning of the GU exemplar for renal obstructions or renal stones. Renal obstructions, particularly renal stones, or urolithiasis, nephrolithiasis, lithiasis meaning calculi or stones, is the first focus we're going to look at. Causes of this may include significant amounts of dehydration, any type of kidney or renal infection, long-term immobility from patients, and extremely high levels of calcium. In particular, there are two types of kidney stones. There are calcium phosphate or oxalate stones, and these will occur when either oxalate or calcium levels in the blood become severely high and they build up in the urinary tract, or they may be uric acid stones. So people with gout or increased uric acid are at higher risk for these stones in particular. On assessment for renal stones, the patients typically will present with flank pain or that costovertebral angle pain. They'll be nauseated because of the pain. Uh, they may have dysuria, which is just difficulty urinating. If there's any sort of tear caused by the stone, there may be blood visually seen in the urine or may be noted in a urinalysis. And again, remember we want to keep an eye on vital signs, specifically blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rate, as these can either decrease or increase depending on their pain response. And we want to make sure that we're doing really good pain assessments so that we can kind of make a guess of where the obstruction may possibly be. For labs and diagnostics, there's going to be a couple of items we want to assess. Tests that might be done will include blood tests to check calcium, phosphorus, and uric acid levels. Again, noting if any of these are high, that could be the risk or the reasoning for the stone. We also want to monitor electrolyte levels. In looking at the kidney function tests, BUN and creatinine we will focus on to see if they become elevated, giving us an idea of hydration status and how it's actually affecting the kidneys in themselves. A urinalysis is utilized to see if there's any red blood cells in the urine or to see crystals that may be eliminated in the urine. A urine culture may be noted to see if there's any thought of being an infection, maybe the cause of the stone. There are also a couple of radiologic procedures that could be done. A KUB x-ray, which is involves the whole GU tract, the kidneys, ureters, and bladder, will show specifically where the stone is located. This gives us a really good idea of where they can start as far as interventions in either breaking up the stone, if it's traveling, if there has been movement from a previous evaluation. IVP or intravenous pilogram is done to look for problems with the structure of the urinary tract in specifically. It will help us find any cause of the blood in the urine and it really gives us a really in-depth look at the entire anatomy of your kidneys and the renal system. It is a diagnostic procedure for stones. Inadvertently, we want to find what the cause of the ongoing back or flank pain is. We want to locate and measure if there is a tumor in the urinary tract. We want to look at the size of the kidney stone. 
figure out why the patient, if they're suffering from recurring urinary tract infections, what is the precursor to that? And we want to focus on looking for any damage to the urinary tract after a particular injury, including previous stones. For all of these labs and diagnostics, we want to make sure that the patient is well educated prior to getting the procedure done. And when we think about the IVP piece, that would actually give us more of a diagnostic look into the whole renal tract. We need to make sure that after the procedure, the patient is well hydrated, whether that being orally or through an IV. So there are two types of patients that come in with stones. One group of patients that would get discharged home come into the ER. If their pain is allowable to be controlled by PO meds, they can go home. No infection is noted, so they've got sent a culture and got preliminary information back. And if they do have nausea, that they can be controlled with PO medications. The patients that then become admitted to the hospital is uncontrolled pain that maybe they need IV pain medication, severe amounts of vomiting leading to dehydration. If there is an infection, if they have excess hematuria, if they only have one kidney, or if they've had a transplant in the past, just because we don't want that obstruction to be on that side causing for bilateral kidney uh, breakdown. So focusing on the nursing plan and interventions, in the short term, we want to make sure that we're managing their pain adequately and that we are providing any type of interventional procedures if necessary to figure out where the obstruction is and if and how it can be eliminated. In the long term, we need to make sure that the patient is aware of what causes um, are increasing their risk for stones. So if calcium levels are significantly high and that's the cause of the stones, we need to decrease their calcium intake. And we always want to, with any patient who suffers with stones, we want to make sure we're increasing their hydration up to 3,000 mLs per day, really maintaining good hydration to keep those kidneys functioning all the way through. Unfortunately, there are complications. We can see patients who have infections that are recurrent, that they aren't getting treated for, they're not continuing their medication regimen, they be, can be, have development of urosepsis and inadvertently can cause acute renal failure. So in looking at interventions to manage these patients while they're under our care, most commonly we're going to give opioid analgesics. Typically we'll give dilaudid morphine or codeine. We can give IV NSAID Toradol for those patients who may be hypotensive during assessments of their pain management. Non-pharmacologic methods to help treat the patient's pain is to get the patient comfortable, changing their positioning, making sure we're not forcing them to move when it increases their pain limiting or allowing visitors, and just doing alternative therapies such as distraction. So in looking at stone removal procedures, there are a couple of interventions that can be utilized in order to help uh, visualize and, and or move the stones out of the areas they're obstructing. So one can undergo a cystoscopy, which is actually an endoscopy of the urinary bladder via the urethra. Um, a cystoscope is inserted through the urethra, 
going towards the bladder and does have a lens on it where they can actually visualize anything that may be obstructing between the bladder um, through the urethra. Extracorporal shockwave lithotripsy is also utilized and is a great technique for treating stones in the kidney and the ureters that does not require surgery. It involves sending high energy shock waves through the body and it helps to break the stones into pieces as small as grains of sand. Because they are broken down into such small pieces, they can pass um, from the body out with urine. So with anyone who we know the stones are going to be passed and we also want to make sure that we are educating them when straining their urine. Renal stenting can also be an intervention, which is really an angioplasty um, in the renal artery where a small catheter in the renal artery is actually placed and the catheter has a balloon on the end that will inflate so that the narrowed area can dilate and then the stone could actually, or the obstruction could actually pass through. One can also have a nephrolithotomy performed, which is an incision into the kidney for the removal of a particular renal calculus. Or a nephrostomy may be performed and it's actually an artificial opening created between the kidney and the skin, which will allow urinary diversion from the upper part of the urinary system. So you may have patients who have nephrostomy tubes that may be hooked up to Foley bags, and that would be the urine that's actually coming right from their kidney. We know we always have to educate our patients, so we want to make sure they have a knowledge, understanding about the amount of pain post-procedure. Um, if they are having any type of intervention, um, a nephrostomy or a nephrolithotomy where they're actually taking a piece um, out of the kidneys, we want to monitor those areas and make sure to look for the signs and symptoms of internal bleeding. The patients also need to be aware of their diet needs. So we need to make sure they're increasing fluids, um, monitoring their calcium and vitamin D levels, decreasing their sodium and animal proteins. In order to maintain actual good diet habits, we want to prevent the reformation of stones. So we would like to avoid foods such as beets, chocolate, spinach, rhubarb, teas, nuts, and any dark colored colas. And this ends the kidney stone presentation.